You need a strong east wind to blow out your preconceived ideas. You need a strong east wind to blow out your religion. You need a strong east wind to blow out the doctrine of the scribes and Pharisees, which still possess your soul because you've not allowed the Holy Ghost to move in you and set you free. A ministry with a vision. A ministry on the move. A ministry established by our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think what God wants to do in his people is make his supernatural Holy Ghost fire and power clear to our sight, clear to our mind, so that there is no doubt in our spiritual creation who God is. Bible for Christ Love International Ministry, a ministry of the vision built on a plan. All right, who's ready for church? Okay, I hope y'all been praying today and seeking the Lord. Now, when we have praise and worship, I don't want to see anybody sitting down. I don't want to see anybody playing over there. I want you to kick off your shoes, your socks, and get to praising God. <laughs> Amen. All right, let's all move up to the front as we pray and we enter into the presence of the Lord. So wonderful to be here on this Wednesday night. I know good things are in store for God's people. Amen. All right. Are we ready back here? Okay. All right. I want you to grab someone's hand. I'll grab Miss Zoe. Yeah. All right. Let's lift up the Lord. Father, we thank you tonight. We are grateful for your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the blood of your Son, Jesus. And as we come together tonight in one accord, as one body, we seek your face. Father, we cry out to you, and we ask tonight, God, that you pour out in great measure your power, your spirit, your word, your authority. Father, let your anointing break open the heavens and fall upon our heart. Lord, let no flesh glory in your presence tonight. Let all the temples shout with glory in the name of Jesus and let the whole church say amen and amen. All right, let your temple praise Jesus. You are not in defeat. You are not losing. Huh? But God has called each and every one of us in a season of victory. And right now we're going to proclaim that we are winning. Huh? God is winning. Huh? God is our champion today.
that the God of all the earth would be in love with me Cause I don't understand how it's possible But he shows me, oh he knows me And he goes, oh yes he goes To find me, to find me But why me? He loves me And you're beautiful, and you're beautiful And he's worthy, and he's holy And he's worthy, and he's holy Oh, 
Hallelujah. I just want to know if, if you want to feel the love of God today, do you want to feel His oil when the Word of God is preached? Will you feel the boldness of the Word surrounding you today? It's surrounding you today. He's worthy. He's worthy. I will get on my knees because he's worthy. I will get on my knees because he's worthy. I will pour out praise because he's worthy. I will sing because he's worthy. I will shout because he's worthy. He's glorious. He's magnificent. So I will pray. Hallelujah. We're just going to proclaim today that he's a healer. That he's a provider. If you've been in need of a healing, if you've been in need of a, a miracle and a work today, guess what? You've come to the right place. Because he's a healer. Ha. We call him our provider, our father, ha. the great I am. We call him El Shaddai. The eyes of fire. We look into the eyes of fire today. Can we worship? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Right there. It's so simple. He's a healer. Just let him heal you today. He's a 
Tasha Sanders is my absolute, one of my most favorite singers ever on the planet. What a ministry. Tonight, I want everyone to stand to your feet. You are in for a surprise and a blessing as well. We are so honored tonight to have the visionary and chief apostle with us tonight. 
And not just with us. He has something special from the Lord to deliver to his people. So with a warm welcome and honor to the Lord and reverence to the Lord, let's honor the man of God as he breaks forth the bread of life, Chief Apostle Timothy Vanover. Well, praise the Lord. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Is somebody excited about Jesus tonight? Oh, come on. That was pitiful. You can do better than that. You're excited about Jesus tonight. All right. Amen. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in a word of prayer. We'll get right into the word tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, God, as we come before you, God, we come not in our own ability nor by our own power, but God, we come by your spirit tonight. Father, let the Holy Ghost have full, complete reign in this service tonight. This is our Word Wednesday, God. Let the Word flow forth tonight in a way that will establish and strengthen us. Make us what you've called us to be, God. God, we dedicate this entire service to thy glory and to thy honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. You can be seated if you want to, but sit down with a shout. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. I've been preaching here lately, you know, about being fishers of men. And I've been preaching lately how it's very difficult to catch the right people when you got your hand in the wrong tackle box. And you start using all that artificial bait, and you start bringing in artificial folks. So you got to get some live bait to bring in some real people that really love the Lord, really love the Word. And what I mean by that, over the last couple of weeks, you know, like I said, earlier last year, God, or at the end of last year, God started speaking to me. And he said, Timothy, you got one thing wrong that you've messed up a lot. And I said, what is that, Lord? He said, you have fed the talent when you should have been feeding the commitment. He said, you fed talent hoping talent would get them sold out and uh, do something for Jesus. You know, if we found out somebody had a talent, said, come on, man, use that talent for the Lord. Come on, man, here, do something for God, and maybe to get you encouraged to be something for the Lord. That was the wrong way to do it. You have to do it the reverse way, commitment. Those that are committed, those that are dedicated, you feed that commitment, feed that commitment, and the gifts and the talents organically come to life. They come to life from the commitment, from the dedication. And that's what we've seen in examples of that. If you want to see a little example of that, uh, JJ is an example of that, commitment before talent. Uh, Mario, commitment before talent. Uh, Zoe, commitment before talent. That, that's, these are people that were put, uh, Skyland, great, look, Sky, Skyland never played the drums before, Danny's live. Skyland never played the drums, now he's, now he's drumming, keyboarding, and he's doing it all, man. Because why? Commitment will bring those things to life. You know, I'll never forget one of the greatest stories that I ever heard growing up was this guy was in our church and he was playing the organ. Oh, man, he played the most beautiful organ that I had ever heard. Just played it fantastically. And just everybody praising the Lord and everything. And after service, somebody asked him, said, well, how did, where did you go to school? Where did you learn to play the organ? He said, oh, I never learned or went anywhere. And they go, do what? He said, oh, I just cleaned the church every day. And I was a janitor at the church. And so I'd go in and sit behind the organ and pray, God, show me how to play this. God, show me how to play this. God, show me how to play this. And he said, one day I got a little ditty. Next day I got another little ditty. Next day I got another little ditty. Before I knew it, I was playing the whole thing. I could play it all. And he said, it's just my father showed me how to do it. Amen. See, that's the thing you're forgetting. Every, do you understand? Get this. Get all this. Every single thing that man has ever done, every song he's ever sung, every play he's ever written, every artwork he's ever painted, don't you understand? None of them did it without the breath of God. Do you understand that? Every talent to paint came from God. Every talent to write came from God. Every talent to sing came from God. Every talent to dance came from God. Now what you do with it after you get that talent is another ball game. But all the talent, whether you like it or not, comes from God. So if you get committed and you get dedicated and you get sold out to God and you say, God, not my will, but your will be done, and you let commitment become more important to you than being seen, then the talents will come alive. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, I want to get into something that I had talked about. I, I preached on this just a little bit on a couple of Sundays back, and I want to go back and revisit it again. There's a few things. Word Wednesday, this is our Wednesday, Word Wednesday. We're really getting to the Word and talk. So I want to get back in there a little bit more and discuss this a little bit more because we kind of flew over this, and maybe some of you caught it, maybe some of you didn't. But I want to go back to it because the Lord really brought it up to me. He said, son, you do realize this is very important to me, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, no, I don't think you're getting it. He says, very, very important to me that when it comes to spiritual interpretation, that you get that spiritual interpretation correctly. Galatians 5, that is where I want to go to, Galatians 5. 
Now, I want to show you something very, very important here. God wants us to realize that when we're bringing the Word of God, it's important for spiritual interpretation. The spiritual interpretation of the Word of God is what provides us with an avenue of the proper perspective. You understand what I'm saying? If you have the right interpretation, then the perspective is proper. But if you have the wrong interpretation, it's going to cause an inferior or erred perspective. And we do not want to cause an erred perspective. We want to bring a concise, solid, and clear perspective. But that can only come through proper interpretation. You have to interpret it properly. The thing you have to realize is, it is the Spirit of God for illumination, understanding, and enlightenment. It is the Word of God for foundation, stability, and validation. Do you understand that? It is the Spirit of God for enlightenment, understanding, illumination. It is the Word of God for foundation, stability, and validity. It validates everything the Spirit is saying. The Word of God is established. That's why both elements must be missing. That's why both elements have to be used. And this is where the modern church has missed it, by excluding either the Spirit or by interpreting the Word of God as legalistic law, ritualism, and ceremonialism instead of relationship-building factors that bring you into a maintained relationship with Jesus Christ. They've got these things backwards. And because they've got them backwards, we're not getting proper interpretation. Do you remember what the Bible says? The Bible says, holy men of old spake as they were what? I'm sorry, as they were what? Holy men of old spake as they were what? So why is that not a standard anymore? So now we speak, we get up, we put together an intellectual speech, we get together and put together some comments and statements that we hope will move this uh, congregation and perhaps maybe enhance the community. But when is it going to come to the place where we go, and, wait a minute, I do not stand behind that pulpit, I do not open that Bible, I do not speak my mouth unless the anointing and the Spirit of God is moving in me. Unless the power and the Holy Ghost is operating in me. I do not open, I do not speak unless the Spirit of God is there. And because we have removed that check, because we've removed that factor, we get streams of sewage that is called water. And it's not water, it's sewage because you've polluted it with your carnality and your physical thinking right off the bat, the minute you put it in there. And let me show you what I'm kind of talking about. Go with me if you would, please. I have heard this mistaught for as long as I can remember. Back when I was in church, they taught it. Taught it wrong, and it's still taught wrong today. Go with me, Galatians chapter 5. In the 22nd verse, the Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit, or the fruit of the Holy Ghost, the work which uh, His presence within accomplishes is love, joy, gladness, uh, peace, patience, an even temper, forbearance, kindness, uh, goodness, uh, benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint, continence, against which such there is no law against these things. Now, if you read this in the King James Version, it's pretty similar, but in the King James Version, we go down to, and it says, but, uh, it says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Now, this has been taught as long as I can remember as the fruits of the Spirit. And that is inappropriate. That is incorrect. That's not what it says. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says the fruit, singular, not multiple, but singular as fruit. Now, you say, Brother Vanover, that's stupid. You're getting picky over it. That doesn't mean anything. It doesn't make any difference whether we say the uh, nine gifts of the Spirit or the nine fruits of the Spirit or the fruit of the Spirit. Oh, yes, it does. You've messed everything up. Can I tell you why it is inappropriate? Can I tell you why it is an error? Can I tell you why you are not teaching by proper interpretation when you say the nine fruits of the Spirit? Do you know why that is an error? Can I tell you? Who would like to know? If you're saying that it's nine fruits of the Spirit, you're saying there are nine separate trees from nine separate seeds that produce nine different elements. That's what you're saying. And if they come from nine separate trees and nine separate seeds, we don't know the purity of the element. Can you say praise God? That is why He said the fruit. Not the fruits, but the fruit. There's only one fruit, one tree, one seed. Can you say, oh, ain't nobody listening to me. I said there's only one seed that those elements flow from. Those elements flow. What's the Bible say? The Bible says the Word of God is the seed. The Bible says the Word of God is the seed. And who is the tree? Jesus is the tree. Can't be a branch unless you got a tree. Come on now, y'all ain't listening to me. 
That and what I want you to understand though is because of the misinterpretation, because this has been misinterpreted, because this has been taught and preached incorrectly, the interpretation is in error. And because the interpretation is in error, your perspective goes in error. And here's what your perspective is. Well, I don't, I, I, I'm loving, but I'm not temperate. No, no, no. You can't be one without the other. See, if you've got the fruit of the Holy Spirit, oh, y'all ain't listening to me. If y'all, oh, y'all ain't listening. If you got the fruit of the Holy Ghost living inside of you, then you got love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And if you don't have one of those operating in you today, then you are not subjected to the Holy Ghost. You're not listening to me. You're not subjected to it. If you're not operating in that very thing every day that you live your life, do you know this? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You're supposed to have love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You're supposed to have those. We say, well, brother, I got the Holy Ghost, but sometimes I just get mad at people. Well, that's because you don't bring your flesh under subjection. See, that's because you've made it okay if someone upsets you for you to react. See, you've already justified that in your mind. That it's okay for you to tell people what you think. It's okay for you to tell people off. It's okay to act that way. See, you never run it through the process of what, what, how would Jesus handle it? Would Jesus do that the same way? Holy Ghost, should I open my mouth or keep my mouth shut? Holy Ghost, should I express how I feel or should I just shut up? See, contrary to what you believe, shut up is in the Holy Ghost vocabulary. In case you don't know, it's there. Just in case you, and it's not quiet. It's not a quiet shut up. <laughs> the Holy Ghost said, man, you need to be quiet. Shh, you don't know what you're talking about. You're messing this up. Shh. But you got to put that extra two bits in there, put that two cents in there. So everybody knows what you're thinking. See, here's the thing. And something as obvious and as easy to see the mistake as in this passage of Scripture, what concerns me is this. If we're getting the interpretation wrong on something as simple as that, the fruit and fruits, if we're getting it simple on something that's so obvious, it says fruit. See, the thing that we don't do, oh, Lord, thank you, God. This is the thing we don't do. We do not examine the spiritual viability of what we're trying to teach people and what we're saying. What is the spiritual viability of that? What is the spiritual, is it viable or is it not viable? And see, the thing they're teaching you when they're teaching you multiple fruits of the Spirit is not viable. Because that means you have to go to nine different trees and get nine different fruits from nine different seeds. That's what that means. Just like an apple. I can hold an apple in my hand. It's red. It's crisp. It's firm. It's juicy. I can smell it. smells good. All those are characteristics of the same thing. If I take an orange, it's orange in color. When you rip back the skin, you can smell the orange spray up. You can bite into it. It's got the fiber of the orange inside of it. It's got that texture. It's got that sweet juice that flows out of it. But those are all still characteristics of the same thing fruit. And see, that's what God's trying to tell you. When you have my spirit, not just when you get baptized, that's the first step. That's jumping in the water. But when you have my spirit living, dwelling, and occupying space inside of you, there are these characteristics that will accompany the fruit of my spirit. And oh, thank you, God. And that is why he said fruit. You understand? That's why he said fruit. Because before fruit, you got to have some. What do you got to have before you get to fruit? Oh, y'all ain't li- See, he's got this whole thing. Yeah, but he's got this whole thing already set up. What do you got to have before you have fruit? What? 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 And seed was the Word of God. So the Bible says, right, who was Jesus? Word of God made flesh and dwelt among us, right? So the Word was the seed, God's Word, put into operation. When it got in operation, it grew a tree. And the tree was Jesus Christ. Can you say praise God? And when we accepted the image of Christ into our lives and submitted and succumbed to Him, it made us available now to be a fruit-bearing tree. 
Can you say praise God? Because see, the fruit don't come until you get the seed in the tree in operation. Can you say praise God? See, Jesus came and cleansed the tabernacle so you could be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. John said, I indeed baptize you with water. He said, but there's one coming after me whose shoe latches I am not worthy to unloose. He going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire. So don't you see the seed and then the image of Christ begins to grow. And as the image of Christ begins to grow, the baptism of the Holy Ghost comes in. As the baptism of the Holy Ghost comes in, you begin to feed on the Word and the Spirit. The Word and the Spirit. And pretty soon as the Word and Spirit begin to start working together, one for illumination and understanding, the other for foundation and, solid- and, and, and validity, and then what happens? Then the tree is ready to produce fruit. And it starts producing fruit. But see, oh, thank you. The tree can't produce fruit until it is full of the nutrients necessary to bring that fruit to fruition. Can you say praise God? Some of y'all are trees, but I don't see no fruit. Some of y'all are trees, but I don't see no fruit. Some of you are trees, and you got the baptism mark on you, but you need to be full of the Holy Ghost. You need to be full of it. How often in the day do you bring your flesh under subjection? How often in the day do you cast down evil imaginations? How often in the day do you say, God, not my will, but your will be done? How often do you do that? Let me ask you a question. How many times in the course of a 24-hour period do you rebuke your flesh? Do you take authority over your flesh? You say, I bind that in the name of Jesus. I cast that down. How often do you do that? Huh? I'm going to tell you something. There's some of y'all right now can't even come up with one thing that you're doing. And you wonder why there's no fruit on your tree. You wonder why you ain't got no fruit. You wonder why you ain't got love. You wonder why you ain't got peace. You wonder why you're not temperate. You wonder why you're not faithful. That's why. So you got to understand something. That's all you got to do. This is like driving a daggum car. If you get down the road and you start running out of gas, you need to go fill the tank up. You got to get the tank filled. Yeah. And see, that's what some of y'all do. Some of y'all get filled with the Holy Ghost, get a full tank, drive it around, run on empty, and just start walking again. Come on, man. Get back to the gas station. Get filled up. Get, get something in there, man. You need to understand something. When we're full is when that life is going to begin to come out of us. See, the problem is we make too much justification for the world. What Do you think you're staying here? Are you planning on staying in this place? Because I'm not. I'm not going to leave a dime for nobody. Just so you know. If there's anything and the doctors come to me and tell me, you got too much to live, I'm selling it all and blowing every dime. Every single dime. I don't have any dimes anyway, but if I had a dime, I would blow a dime. You know, I don't care. I want to be full of the Holy Ghost. That was the requirement, that you be full, that you be full, that you be full. And I'm going to tell you something. When you go around and you don't have love and you don't have joy and you don't have peace, you don't have long-suffering, you don't have gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance, when you don't have any of those elements, your tank is getting empty. Your Holy Ghost tank needs something. You can't carry around a a gas can with you and fill you up when you need it. you got to make contact with the Lord and keep contact with the Lord all the time. It's about a maintained relationship. You might say, Brother Vanover, this seems quite silly. Maybe it is to you, but I promise you it's not to the Lord. He wanted it very clear that His fruit only comes from one seed. That His fruit only comes from one element, from one tree. And that fruit is able to produce love, joy, gladness, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, humility, self-control, self-restraint. Against such, there is no law. See, letting our flesh rage is not impressive to anyone. And it's certainly not impressive to the kingdom of God. You need to realize just because you got up and you let your flesh rage and you said what you thought and you told somebody off and you told them what was on your chest, well, good for you, but I doubt it was very pleasing to the Lord. See, there's a thing called righteous indignation. 
And that's when God gets angry about something that's righteous, something to be angry about. And I'll tell you, what you don't understand is, you'll go and condemn somebody for what you see on the outside or something maybe you've heard. But see, what God's looking at is what's on the inside. Is your tree full of his presence? Is your tree full of his spirit? Are you producing fruit? Is there fruit being born out of you? When people come up to you, are they going to find the image and nature of Jesus Christ? Or are they going to find the image and nature of Christ in the basement while you're running around the house? Who are we going to find? I want to find Jesus in my house. Amen. I want Jesus in your house. The Lord told me, he said, Timothy, what makes this dangerous is because it's only just a small thing. But if we mess up this small thing, how many more small things have we messed up? Because we've tried to interpret them with our carnal understanding, with our carnal knowledge. You need to understand something. You're never going to figure this word out with this mind. If you think you're going to figure it out with your natural mind, you apparently have never read the Bible or you don't know Jesus. Because the Bible says the carnal mind, this is Romans 8, the carnal mind is enmity. That means hostile, against, cannot be for. Is not for God, not now, and never indeed can be. It is the only unclean thing that must be removed. We don't remove it. We justify it. We keep it around and we justify it. I want to know. When you're going to rise up in the anointing, rise up in the spirit, rise up in the power of God, and let the word of God be that sharp, two-edged sword that will cut asunder of soul and morrow and begin to cut away all elements that hinder you, begin to cut away all elements that keep you from the excellency of Jesus Christ. When are you going to start saying, I've played around long enough. It's time to get committed, dedicated, and sold out. Listen, there are some folks in here, I love you, God bless you. You might not have 20 years left. You might not have 30 years left. Some of you may have less than 10. So what are you going to do? Are you going to sit around waiting for tomorrow to get committed? You, I want you to think for some. How, long, how much life have you lived today? I want you to think about the years of life that you have lived. The years that you've been on this planet. And I want you to look back on that life and I want you to tell me exactly how many years you have totally 100% dedicated to Jesus Christ in those years. How much have you dedicated? I'm going to say, God, not my will, but your will. God, not what I want, but you want. God, I don't care about these things. I just care about you. I'm just going to be obedient to you. I'm going to follow your spirit. I'm going to follow you. See, you say, Brother Vandal, why do you do that to me? Just, I just want to serve God, do my thing, leave me alone. And you can do that. You can do that. But I'm not going to have your blood on my hands. I'm going to tell you what God wants. Whether you want to do it or not, it's up to you. But, and most people don't listen anyway. I mean, most people, when you tell them the corrections they need to make in their life, most people set from a position of self-justification that thinks they don't need to make any changes. That they're just fine and they're hunky-dory and they're okay. They don't have any problems in their life. That everything's going well. Bills are getting paid. Everybody's happy and that's great and life is grand. But how many of you know that's not necessarily the case? You know what? When's the last time? When is the last time you got so in the presence of God that you didn't recognize anything else around? You were so lost in the presence of God that you could share with Him anything. You could tell Him anything. And you just poured your heart out to Him. And God wrapped His arms around you, loosed His anointing on you. And you had a, you had a fellowship with God. When's the last time you did that? That was too long ago. You need to do it again. Maybe I'm mistaken. But Pastor Colley, what does the Bible say about doesn't it say pray with what? I'm sorry, pray with what? Pray with what? Do you pray when you're driving down the road? Do you talk to God? Do you ask God to open up your understanding? You say, God, fill me with your word. God, let your word be resonant in me. God, establish your word. Let it pour out of me like water over the rock. God, just let it pour out of me. Let it be undisputable, but let it be undeniable. Do you say that? Do you pray that? Do you ask that? Do you talk to God about that? And just hurry, you gotta get to work and be late. You gotta get to work and be late. Don't be late. Don't be late. Don't be late. Don't be late. You get to work and be late. Now let me tell you something. You got nothing better to do every morning than start the day in prayer. Start the day in saying, God, not my will, but your will. Not my what if what if that day is your last day? What if you hop in your car and it's the last time you ever get in the car? Huh? Here's all you gotta tell me. This is all you gotta say to me. Anybody watching everywhere, it's all you gotta do. If you can say right now, without any shadow of a doubt, one one bit, that you know that you can stand before the throne room of God and say, I did everything I was supposed to do. 
I did everything I could do for you, Lord. I didn't need one more day, one more second, one more time. It's all done. I got it all done. But how many of you are going to go and stand before that throne and say, man, I wish I'd done more. I wish I'd have prayed more. I wish I'd sought God more. You know what? Everything they told me was true. I'm sitting here throwing with God, and God's real. God's true. God's mighty. God's powerful. God's awesome. If you have not done everything you want to do for the Lord today, then what in the world are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for an engraved invitation? Are you waiting for God to make up a proper payment plan, an insurance plan that will fit you good so that you can do this? Are you ready to say, God, not my will, your will be done. God, not me, but you. God, I'm ready to be everything you call me to be. God, I pray. Lord, let the word of God be more than just words on a page. Let it establish me. Let it bring me forward. Let it, bring, let, let it be more uh, necessary to me than my necessary food. I'm telling you something. You better get ready. God is getting ready to do a shaking. And he's getting ready to find out who's serious and who's not. He's getting ready to find out who's a fruit producer and who is not a fruit producer. And just because your apple looks good on the outside. When God finds a worm in there, he's going to throw it away. It ain't, it ain't how pretty it looks. It's the substance. It's what's inside. It's what's in there that makes the difference. Amen? Isn't that right? Praise God. Look what he says. Envy. Drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you beforehand, just as I did previously, that those that do such things shall not walk. I'm sorry, they shall not what? You do know what this is talking about, right? If you're going out partying, drinking, doing drugs, messing with boys and girls and all kinds, you realize that's what it's talking about, right? You got that? Oh, y'all didn't hear that. Y'all better get that. I want you to know this. I don't want you to be confused about this. I want you to know, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. Anything that's like it. Anything. Doesn't matter. Anything that's like it. If you're drinking, partying, carousing, lock around, speaking dirty crap coming out of your mouth. Nasty, filthy stuff coming out of your mouth. Well, Brother Vanderbilt, God don't care about it. Yes, he does. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that is a sudden to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness, I'm in trouble. Sir. I have a question for you. If you've ever been drunken, if you've ever caroused around, if you've ever done the like, and he told you, these people should not inherit the kingdom of God. So there's only one thing that will get you to inherit the kingdom of God from that position. And what is it? Forgiveness. Repenting. And can I tell you the difference? Can I tell you about it? This is going to get you mad. If you repented of it, you've never done it again. You don't go back and do it again. If you repent of it, you don't go back and do it again. You say, I have repented. What, what, what did he say to the woman? He said, where are thy accusers? And she said, there are none here, Lord. He said, then neither do I accuse you. But go and sin no more. He said, you've now been forgiven, but now you got to go. Get smart. Figure it out. Man, you ain't going to do this thing doing it your way. If you think you're going to do such things and set in the house of God, you can do it for a season. You can hide for a little while. Don't worry. Sooner or later, something's going to come rolling up on your house that you can't handle, that you can't deal with. You're going to be picking up that phone and calling Pastor Chris. And you know why you're going to want him over there? Because you see in him love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Because he's got fruit on his tree. He's got fruit on his tree. What's the Bible tell us? Let's, come on, Bible scholars. Preach back at me tonight. What's the Bible tell you when happens when the master comes and there's no fruit on the tree? I'm sorry, what happened, Jackie? What happens, Jackie? That's right. Jackie yelling from our sound booth. She says he hews it and throws it in the fire. And that is true. Can I tell you something that's going to make you mad? There's a reason 
why you need to understand the concept of fruit and its characteristics. Because one of these days, he's going to come to your tree. And he's going to look for love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, temperance. If he doesn't find fruit on your tree, he's going to say, hmm, maybe it's time to hewn it and throw it into the fire. But thank goodness. Thank goodness for somebody called Jesus. <laughs> thank good for somebody called Jesus. Because Jesus is going to step up there and say, now, Lord, just a minute. Give me a little time. I'm working on this tree. I'm digging around it, slapping it. Straighten it out. Come back next week, God. Come back next week. Maybe I'll get a grape out of it. Come on back, Lord. Come back. We'll work our way up to pomegranates. Let's just get a grape today. <laughs> Some of y'all laughing. The seed in the stencil. Better get ready. Because God has just started. He's getting ready. And you can already see it across the land happening already. I never he's coming by and he's opening your door. And you say, Brother, what do you mean? He's exposing your closet. He's exposing what you've hid in your closet. What you thought God didn't see. What you thought God didn't know about. What you thought you could hide in that closet. Honey, all across the country, everybody coming out of the closet. There's a reason why. God's slinging the door open. He's saying, you can't hide in there no more. You can't stay in there no more. I want to know, is there fruit in your tree? I want to know, is there word in you? I want to know, is there a night thing in you? I want to know. That's what the Lord's wanting to know. That's what God's wanting to know. But he goes on and says, But the fruit of the Holy Ghost, the work which His presence within accomplishes. Oh my Lord. Are you looking what He's telling you? The work that the Holy Ghost accomplishes inside of you. When the Holy Ghost is living and dwelling inside, it accomplishes something. It moves you forward. It brings these characteristics and elements of the fruit out. But you can't have a mountain forth if you don't let the Holy Ghost do its work. Amen? And it says, In love, joy, gladness, peace, and patience, even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, benevolence, and faithfulness, gentleness, meekness, and humility, self-control, self-restraint, Continence. Against such there is no law that can bring a change, a charge, excuse me. And those who belong to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, have crucified what? Have crucified what? And the flesh is identified and the amplified is what? What is identified as? Human nature. Flesh is what? What is flesh? What is flesh? What does that mean? It means it is without any characteristics or attributes of God. It is Godless. That means it has no God in it. Zero. The Bible tells us the flesh profits what? Flesh profits what? So why do you keep defending? Why do you keep supporting it? Why do you keep making excuses for it? The devil manipulates you more in the course of your day through your flesh than any other single object at all. And the longer you allow your flesh to be present, the longer he will manipulate you. The sooner you bring that flesh under subjection to the Spirit, the anointing, and the power of God, the sooner those things will change. The sooner those things will be rearranged. And those who belong to Jesus Christ the Messiah have done something. He said, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you've done something. I'm sorry, what did you do? Christopher Colley, without giving me the correct answer. Because I know you know the right answer. But what element can you muster up? What element can we muster up to crucify your flesh? What can we do? Can we muster something up to crucify your flesh, Chris? Can you muster something up to crucify your flesh? Nope. 
can't put, he can't come out straight again to crucify his flesh, can he? Now I want you to stop. I want you to stop and think about this for just a minute. How many of you in here have been a Christian for 20 years or more? Raise your hand up. How many have been a Christian for 30 years or more? How many have been a Christian for 40 years or more? 50? Good. We got a couple. Good. All right. So all you Christians that have been here, Christians forever and ever, please tell me what element crucifies you and gives you the experience Jesus had through crucifixion and resurrection. What element does it? Now let's stop and think for a minute, okay? Water baptism. I go down in the water. That is symbolic of my spiritual flesh man dying. As I rise up, I rise up with a new life, a new heart, a new soul. That is me coming forward in a new life and a new soul. What element took place in that action that will allow me to follow through with what I said I was going to do? What happens when I come up out of there that gives me the power to say no to my godless natural nature? What? I want to hear. Tell me. Well, I could get up and say, I'm going to love God. I'm going to serve God. I want to serve God now. Hasn't man been saying that for 6,000 years? Yes, right? 2,000 years ago, didn't they want to serve God? They weren't going in the water because they didn't want to serve God. They were going in the water because they tried everything. They tried the law. They tried every legalistic, ceremonial, ritualism thing they were. And every ritual and every ceremony never brought them closer to God. Never did anything for them. Never brought anything through them. And going in that water was a symbol to God. Saying, God, we need something more powerful. We need something greater. We need something mightier. And you know what? God did not leave His children without. God did not ignore His children. God did not turn His back on His children. God answered His children. And He sent them. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the only begotten Son of the living God. And Jesus came. And Jesus was born. And Jesus walked this earth. And He came for a purpose. He came for a reason. To pay for your sin. To pay for my sin. So that our tabernacles could be clean. So that we could finally have the element that God always wanted us to have. Have you ever just read your Bible? Come on, I'm just talking about reading it. Have you read your Bible? What's the Bible say? What did Jesus tell him? Tarry ye in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high. The what did he call it? The promise of our Father. Isn't that what he said? It's the, wait a minute, I thought Jesus was the promise. God said, I want you to be able to come into a place where you can relate with me. Where you can sup with me. Where you can sit with me in my presence. And I can affect you. He said, I can't do that as long as flesh rules. As long as flesh controls you. But I will come with the blood of Jesus Christ. I will wash the sin away. And then the tabernacle is ready. To receive entrance of new material. Entrance of new elements. And I got a question for you. I don't know about nobody else in here. I want to speak for Timothy Vanover. But I can tell you, when I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I only received it one time. I received it when I was 11 years old, fell out in the Spirit, and spoke in tongues for 45 minutes. Nonstop, and it never stopped since. And I'm going to tell you something. When I got up from the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I had love, I had joy, I had peace. I was cool, I was content, man. And you know what? Later on that night, later on in the day, when the enemy tried to fight me, when my flesh tried to come up, I'd bind it, rebuke it, start speaking in tongues, and guess what? It left. It went away. It was gone. It was out of there. Honey, let me tell you something. When I experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the Lord took my hands and said, no longer shall you do the work of God with your own hands, but from this day forward, my hands shall work for you. He took my feet, said, no longer shall you walk in your ways, but from this day forward, the Word of God shall be a lamp under your feet, and you shall walk by that. He crucified and removed my carnal mind, replaced it with the mind of Christ. And then out of me came the blood and the water. That's what you're getting tonight. I'm giving you blood and water. I'm giving you word and spirit. Because if you'll reach into that side, you'll be transformed. If you'll reach into that side, you'll be changed. If you'll reach into that side, all your doubt and unbelief will go. If you just reach and say, yes, Lord. Say, yes, Lord. Amen? I want you to listen to this. Look at it now. And those who belong to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, 
have crucified the flesh, the godless human nature, with its passions, appetites, and desires. Do you believe that's true? Do you believe the Word of God is true? Do you? Then how come we preach services based on people's physical desires and physical wants? Why are we preaching messages telling people about new cars and homes and houses and rich and being wealthy and getting a new wife and a new husband and this and that and becoming faith? Why are we telling them? We have not changed the desire. The desire of the world is the same. We just slapped Jesus on it. But how many of you know God is raising up real disciples, real men and women of God that are going to say, I don't want this world. I reject this world. I bind this world. I don't want the elements of this world. I don't want to be confused with anything in this world. I want to walk by the Spirit. I want to walk by the power. I want to walk by the anointing of a living God. I want to know that greater is He that is in me than He that's in the world. The words that I speak will not be my words, but they will be the words spoken by the Holy Ghost and the anointing of a living God. Those will be the words that I speak. Amen? How many of you understand what I'm saying? There is no other place in the Bible, knock yourself out, where you'll find a more complete description of how the crucifixion of Jesus Christ should occur than right here. If you're crucified with Him, the godless nature will gain. If you're crucified with Him, You don't want the things of this world. You don't desire the things of this world. Now listen to me. I'm telling you, is that right? You guys can rebuke me if you want. If you think I'm wrong, Job, I'm going to say, you're wrong, brother. That's fine. Do you think I'm wrong when I tell you, do you think I'm wrong when I tell you that the godless nature, if the Holy Ghost is in command and the flesh has been brought under subjection to the Spirit of God, is the godless nature gone? It's under control, right? By the Spirit and anointing of God, yes? But if I am still desiring the things of the world, if my, and here's the thing, <coughs> Lord knows it don't happen for me, so I know this ain't my room. <coughs> but I'm not up here preaching to get likes. I'm not trying to get numbers. I don't care about all that. I want real people that love the Word, that love the Spirit of God. Ain't nobody going to like what I'm saying anyway. Because when I'm not, I'm not telling you to have a, I'm not going to tell you to have a sweet little uh, uh, couch ride to heaven. I'm telling you there's going to be some bumps along the way. Going to be some thorns. You need to know how to fight back. You need to be, have the power and the spirit and the anointing of a living God inside of you. Amen. But this is how we know that you're not full of the Holy Ghost. That's how we know that you're battling or you're struggling. When I look at you, you don't have peace. When I look at you and you're not temperate. When I look at you and you're all frustrated and flustered and afraid, it's because you're listening to your carnal man and not to the spiritual man. And so what needs to happen is a crucifixion. So what we do is we take the Word and we take the Spirit and we combine them together to release established truth. As established truth is released, it flashes a mirror right up in our face and shows us where we're lacking in the ways of the Lord. And we begin to make those adjustments, begin to make those changes. The Spirit begins to make those changes and those adjustments. So we begin to look more like Him and less like us. Can you say praise God? Some of you today do not practice that art of crucifixion in your life. Do you not even remember the Bible tells you in the very beginning? He said, pick up your cross and do what? Pick up your cross and do what? Pick up your cross and do what? Follow me. Hey, you boys over there, grab that little cross. So we take the Word and the Spirit of God, we make truth. With that established truth, we can begin to bring our flesh under subjection. As we begin, the little one, as we begin to bring the flesh under subjection, not the big one, y'all can't carry that big one. That's the Jesus cross. As, as you bring your flesh under subjection, then the spiritual man begins to rise. And all those characteristics of the fruit are put back into operation. And so what happens is, and Timothy's in need of crucifixion. He takes the Word and he takes the Spirit of God and he crucifies Timothy. I pick up my cross and follow him. C-R-O-S-S. I crucify my flesh, ratify my spiritual man, and I overcome sin through the Spirit of God. And when I do that, when all that's done, when I've allowed the truth 
to crucify my flesh. I've allowed established truth to bring me back into the mindset of revelation, revelation to embrace, to, to transformation, to manifestation. Then what happens is when people see me, they don't see the fruit of Timothy. They see the fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. They see love, peace, joy. Something happens. Timothy gets replaced. Now it's X level. Now it's X level. See, you don't understand. The cross is there for crucifixion, but it's down for resurrection. Come on, y'all ain't hear me. It's down for resurrection. Come on. And from that X comes the image and nature of Jesus Christ. Because the letter X represents Jesus Christ. Can you say praise God? Amen. How many of you say amen tonight? Praise God. You boys can take my X cross back. Thank you, boys. So it goes on and says, If we live by the Holy Ghost, let us also walk by the what? Spirit. If by the Holy Ghost we have our life in God, let us go forward. Walking in line, our conduct controlled by something. What is your conduct controlled by? Spirit. Conduct controlled by what? Spirit. Question for you. <clears throat> is it the Spirit telling me that I'm going to be the biggest preacher that's ever been? Is it the Spirit telling me I need to look for the big stage? Is it the Spirit telling me I need to get big offerings? Is the Spirit telling me that I need to charge for my prophecies? Charged for my books. Charged for all my stuff. No, that's not the Spirit. That's you. Because the Spirit understands. The Spirit is not about lifting you up. Because you can't help anybody. It's going to lift up Jesus. Because the Word said, if He be lifted up, He would draw them in unto Him. Amen? If He be lifted up, He would draw on to Him. But what does the Bible tell us we have to be? See, here's what I'm, I'm preaching this because I think it's funny. Think of the perspective and think of the messages and everything that's been preached to the world today, supposed Christianity. How often have you heard you must be controlled by the Holy Ghost? Every action, every word, every step must be controlled by the Holy Ghost. Do you hear that? Do you turn that on? No, you don't hear that. You hear you're going to be a millionaire. You're going to be rich. You're going to be famous. God wants all of His people to be wealthy and rich. We're already wealthy and rich. Did you realize that you're already wealthy and rich? Your father owns a cattle on a thousand hills, man. Your father will give you what you need when you need it. But he doesn't want a bunch of crying babies around asking for stuff when they don't need it. Amen? Well, let's go on. i got to hurry. I'm not going to get through all this tonight. I'm going to get through this hurry. Let us not become vainglorious and self-conceited, competitive and challenging and provoking and irritating one another, envying and being jealous of one another. Another thing you'll find out real quick, is when the Holy Ghost is not full in you, you become competitive. You want to compete because your flesh wants to succeed. Your flesh wants to always be first. So whenever you have that competitive spirit, or you've got that kind of attitude, we know the Holy Ghost is not moving on you. Because you're trying to be competitive. Somebody at the Holy Ghost is moving on go, I don't care who wins as long as God gets glory. I don't care. See, it's a different kind of thing. It's a different kind of attitude. It's a different perspective. And the perspective comes from proper interpretation. Because we have proper interpretation, we understand what this word is talking about. He's not talking about fruits. He's not talking about nine fruits from nine different trees from nine different seeds. He's talking about one fruit with nine characteristics from one seed and one tree. And that's, what, that's important, though. That changes, the, that changes the entire comprehension and understanding of what you're talking about. It changes it all. Because you're like, well, okay, where are these nine trees? I'll go find me one of those trees. And it gives you excuses to say, well, I can have one without having the other. That's not what he said. If you got it, you got it all. Beware of being vainglorious, of being competitive, of competing with one another. Don't do that. Avoid those things. I want you to go with me in the Scripture, if you would, please. I'm going to go back to the passage I closed on the other day. Go with me, if you would, please, to Colossians. Colossians 2. Colossians 2, I'm reading this out of Amplified. Colossians 2 and 20. If then you have died with Christ, at, let's say, if then you have died with Christ to material ways of looking at things and have escaped the world's crude and instrumental, uh, notorious, and teaching of externalism. So a question for y'all. 
This is saying, if we've been crucified with Christ, we don't desire materialistic things anymore. Isn't that what it says? You tell me. I'm asking. That's what it looks like it says to me. It says, if I've been crucified with Christ, I don't want this stuff. I don't want material things. I know these things can't change me. I know they can't help me. Let's go and look what it says. Why do ye live as if... As if what? Uh Uh-oh. How is it you live as if you still belong to the world? And can I tell you something? If you had really good friends in the world and they're still your friends, you ain't done something right. Why are they still hanging out with you? Why haven't you told them, hey, we don't drink around here. We don't cuss around here. We don't do that kind of stuff around here. We lift up Jesus. How about coming over and having a Bible study with me and my Bible group this next week? I'll bet they're not your friend much longer. What do you bet? See, the problem is we're afraid of making people feel uncomfortable. We're afraid that we might offend somebody. But you know what? If there was ever a time for people to start getting uncomfortable, that time is now. If there was ever a time for people to start being offended, that time is now. Let me ask you a question. How are you going to feel when you stand before God and He flashes all the faces up before you of the people that came to you that you should have talked to, that you should have said something to, that you should have made feel uncomfortable, that you should have spoke the truth to, that now their blood is all on your hands? How are you going to feel about that? It is time for the church to stand up like it's never stood up before. And it's time for the church to return to proper spiritual interpretation of the Word of God. Holy men of old spake as the Holy Ghost moved upon them. It's time to use the Word and the Spirit of God to establish truth, to bring revelation into focus, and to cause that revelation to cause a change in you, a transforming change that will bring the manifestation of Christ's image and nature. That's what it's all about. And that's what it's for. But... Ask that question. If you ask, ask yourself that question. Ask yourself that question. Why do we live as if we're still in the world? Huh? Why? Why? Can I tell you something? We're more interested in what we can attain, what we can get, and what we can grab hold of than we are seeing people's lives change, seeing people's hearts rearranged. You know, you can't get up and say something unless you yourself do it. And Jenny and I made a decision a couple years ago. We're going to take everything we got, and it's all going into revival. It's all going to go to minister to people and bless people and everything. And Jenny and I have done that. We've done everything we have. We gave it. We are max to the max to get out there because the only thing we cared about was revival. Minister, That's the name of this church, Revival for Christ. And that's what we're going to do. And I can sit around and worry about it. I can sit around shaking my head. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do. But you know what? My father owns cattle on a thousand hills. I know what I'm doing it for. And I know he's going to bless me. And if he doesn't, if I don't get any physical blessing whatsoever, I'm cool with that. My blessing's in heaven. My blessing's in glory. You know what my blessing was? My blessing was when I went to a church that couldn't have the kind of praise that we could bring. Couldn't have the kind of dance that we could bring. Couldn't have the kind of preaching that we could bring. But we brought preaching and dance and praise and worship in that place. People were filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. People were healed. People were changed. So thank you very much. I have my reward. Thank you very much. Amen. What are you looking for? You know what I'm looking for? Souls to be saved. Souls to be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what matters to me. That's the most important thing to me. And you know, if i got to sell every single thing i got, then Jenny and i got to get us a little pup tent. And we'll make do. Because I know greater is He that is in me than he that's in the world. Amen? Now I want you to look what it says. Why do you love? Why do you live as though you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to rules and regulations such as do not handle this or do not taste this or do not even touch them? Referring to things all of which perish with being used. To do this is to follow human precepts and doctrines. Such practices have indeed the outward appearance that popularity passes for wisdom. (laughs) I love that. He said, oh yeah, they got outward wisdom. It looks like it's real smart outwardly. It looks real smart outwardly. It looks like you got real intelligence outwardly. He says, um, for wisdom, in, self, in promoting 
self-imposed rigor and devotion and delight in self-humiliation and uh, severity of discipline of the body, but they are of no value in checking the indulgence of the flesh. See, that's the problem, people. Do you check the indulgence of your flesh? Have you checked the indulgence of your flesh? Have you brought the indulgence of your flesh under control to the Spirit and the anointing of God. It is time that the church rise up and begin to reject an indulgence of flesh. It's time the church begin to rise up and say this carnal man shall pass away. Behold, I am more interested in the spiritual man. I'm more interested in what God is going to do. I'm more interested in revelation, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, maintaining a relationship with my Heavenly Father and learning how to flow and operate by the unction and power of the Holy Ghost. Those should be things you're more interested in. Come on. You want the world? That's what you want. You want the world. That's what you want. You want the world. Do you not know it's all going to pass away? All the money in the bank is going to be gone. All the credit cards are going to be burned. Every car, every house, nothing's going to be left. You know that. You're fighting for ashes. You're fighting for ashes. So I learned something, Pastor. You can fight for ashes, or you can become the fire. It's up to you. It's up to you. You can fight for ashes, or you can become the fire. As for me, I'm going to become the fire. Amen. I'm going to consume. I'm going to burn. I'm fire. You know, I remember Tasha Willis said this one time. It's so true. She said, God's got it set up. You're going to get fire. Either you're going to get Holy Ghost fire. Or you're going to get hellfire, but you're going to get one. Fire's coming one way or another. There will be fire. It would be best to get it now. <laughs> get the fire now. This flesh is going to get consumed one way or another. If you're trying to save this guy, he ain't getting saved. Do you realize this man will not survive this earth? Do you know that? This will not happen. This man will pass from this earth. But it's the man inside. It's that spiritual creation inside that will last for all eternity, that will live forever. Let that anointing, let that spirit, let that power begin to come alive in you. Begin to look at the parts in your life that need to be hewed up. Begin to look at the fallow ground in your life that needs to be turned up. Turn it up. Put that seed in. Let the tree come. Let the fruit come. And begin to be the vessel that God called you to be. Amen? But they have no value in checking the indulgence of their flesh, the lower nature. Instead, they do not honor God, but serve only to indulge flesh. Only to indulge the flesh. And ask yourself this question. Are we not preaching messages that cause congregations to indulge the flesh? When I preach a message of, if you want a brand new car, give $1,000 tonight, and you'll, get one to, you'll be able to get one. God's going to bless you. I'm teaching you to indulge your flesh. When I spend an hour on an offering, trying to get you to give so you can get. That is an indulgence of your flesh. I'm not here to indulge your flesh. I'm here to stir up your spirit. I'm here to stir up the anointing. I'm here for you to understand that God's more than these things we can see and touch and taste and smell. God is greater than all these things. You need to understand the life that is coming for us, the life that we have beyond this one is far greater than anything this life could ever offer. So stop wasting your time on dust and start being the flame, the fire God called you to be. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord. I had more, but I think that's going to be it for tonight. Praise I hope you guys got something out of what I had to say tonight. I don't always go back and redo anything, but I just felt led to do that today. And I hope you got something out of what I went back for. Praise God. All right. Because I didn't get to explain it the other night, so I'm going to explain tonight. Praise the Lord. You have to realize, you have to come to the understanding and understand that God is looking for you to be pure. God is looking for you to be full of the Word and the Spirit of God. Not to be full of man's wisdom, man's knowledge, man's precepts. He wants you to be full of God's wisdom, God's knowledge, God's precepts. That's what He wants you full of, and that's what we as a body of believers are going to seek. That's what we as a body of believers are going to move forward in. Amen? Praise God. Come here, Jeff. 
Praise the Lord. Jeff, there's opportunity before you, but you have to get really serious. This will be the most serious thing you've ever done in your life. The most serious thing you've ever decided. And it could change the course of your life for all of your life. But when you make it, you have to be committed to it. You can't keep washy-washy, go back and forth. You've got to stay committed and dedicated. This is one thing you don't turn back from. So I'm going to pray for you right now. That God's going to help you make the right decisions. Going to help you do the right things. Right now, Father, not by my power, but in the name of Jesus Christ, right now, God, change. Powerful change, God. Powerful change. Powerful change. Powerful change. Come here, Tasha. God said every burden, every chain the devil's been trying to hook on with hooks and pull you down is going to be snapped right now. It's going to be broken. And what God's about to do is God's going to flush you with the oil of His anointing. The oil of His anointing is going to fill you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet and it's going to push out everything that's been hindering you, everything that's been keeping you down and making you feel not right. And God says, it's all going to get right. going to get right right now. There it is. Well, there it is. There it is. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come here, Skyland. Praise God. Right over here, Sky. Get your hands up. God said there's going to be Something powerful. Something very miraculous is about to happen to you. God said it's about steps. Step, step, step. Next step, next step. X step, X step. God said, son, it's time to move up higher. It's time to become more dedicated, more committed, more sold out than you've ever been before. He said, this is surrender time. It's step time, surrender time, soundness time. It's time. It's time. Get ready. A powerful anointing will rush over you and you will know that what I've spoken is not my words, but His words in Jesus' name, I pray. There it is. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come here, Zoe. For daughter, long before you ever breathed breath on this planet, I had a plan for you. I anointed you even in your mother's womb. And daughter, I called you to be different. I called you to be so different. And I called you to carry my word and to carry my spirit and to carry my anointing. And just like Elijah threw the mantle over Elisha. And Elisha wanted to go back and say goodbye, but Elijah said no. And he went on and Elisha went after him. The Lord said, leave the past in the past. You're free from it. God's put a new mantle on you. Follow the one who God's put the mantle on. You shout up a book. Follow the mantle. Follow the mantle. Follow the mantle, right? Follow the mantle. Hello, my name is Ryan Colley. I'm International Evangelist and Administrative Vice President of Revival for Christ Club International Ministries. We'd like to thank you so much for tuning into our program today. And if you would like to help us take a revival around the world to our friends in Honduras, Mexico, Singapore, and Malaysia, this is how you can do it. First off, you can send your checks or money orders to 1005 Southwest 4th Street in Moore, Oklahoma, 73160. You can also call in with credit card at 405-793-1777. That's 405-793-1777. And finally, you can do it through the Cash App. That's money sign RFC ROAR. That's money sign RFC ROAR. Thanks in advance for helping us take the flame around the world. Remember, we are a ministry with a vision built on a plan, the Word of God.